We're at Acts chapter 2 this morning. I've always made it my business since I come here to preach on Easter Sunday. And uh, I trust that as long as I'm here, I will be able and allowed to do that. I think it's one morning that uh, we love to turn to the Word of God and to preach the Word of God. I want you to open your Bible at Acts chapter 2, and we'll be reading a couple of verses shortly. So you just keep it open there, and uh, we'll turn to the Scriptures soon. Our Lord Jesus Christ was not the first person to be raised from the dead. In fact, there were six raised from the dead before him. Three in the Old Testament and three in the New Testament. In the book of Kings, we have the three in the Old Testament. Elijah raised the widow of Sarephah's son. Elisha raised the woman of Shunammite's son. And when they buried a man mistakenly in the grave of Elisha, as soon as his bones touched him, he came to life and stood on his feet. You'll find those references in 1 Kings 17, verse 19, 2 Kings 4 and verse 34, and 2 Kings 13 and verse 21, for those who want to study it when you're listening to the CD. In the New Testament, uh, there were three. Jairus' 12-year-old daughter, Mark 5, the son of the widow of, widow of Nain, Luke 7, and Lazarus in John 11. Now, when you think of those three in the New Testament, always remember, remember that uh, Jairus' daughter was in bed when she died. The son of the widow of Nain was on the coffin, and Lazarus was in the grave. Now, if you think of that, the process... And that process has been carried on at this moment as we speak. Because sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And as I speak to you the, uh, just now, this morning, there are those dying in their bed. There are those who have moved on a little bit into the coffin. And there are those who are in the grave. That's the process. Jairus' daughter was just dead. The son of the widow of Nain would have been dead a few hours because they bury on the same day. And Lazarus was four days dead. To spiritualize that, my friends, this morning, it took the same power to raise all three of them. It took the power of the living word of the living God. Now to Jairus' daughter, he would have spoken softly because he was beside her. To the son of the city of Nain, he would have spoken a little louder because there was a great crowd round the coffin. And at the grave of Lazarus, he shouted. He shouted. And in the spiritual application to that, God speaks once, say it twice, yet three times, say it three times. Sometimes he speaks softly. Sometimes he has to raise his voice. And sometimes he shouts. There's three times our Lord shouted in the scriptures. And there's sometimes he has to Shout loud. And I wonder, am I speaking to someone just now this morning and uh, he has spoken to you softly and you knew it was him, but you never heeded his voice. 
And maybe I'm speaking to someone this morning and maybe the same person and then there was a time he shouted or, or he's talked more loudly to you, more aggressively to you. And there was a day that he shouted and he raised his voice in some incident or some calamity in your life to draw your attention, but you're still not saved. Well, there comes a day when his voice stops speaking. And it's the same with those backsliders listening to me and watching me this morning. There's a time when he'll stop speaking to you too. So I say to you, heed his voice. The difference in all six of these and our Lord Jesus Christ was, of course, that they all died again. They had to go through the oracle of death the second time. Someone said to me one time, it would be nice to die and rise again and I don't want that. I don't want to die and come back to this old world and live again. And I'm sure you don't either. What is there to live for when you look at the news? When you look around us? No, no, I'll wait. I'll wait till he takes me home. Now, Peter in... The reason that all these three died again was because death reclaimed them. You see, death has a claim on us. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death, and we're all sinners. Death reclaimed them, but death didn't reclaim him. Peter in his sermon on the day of Pentecost said in Acts chapter 2, look at verse 22. We're going to read these three verses. In this great sermon on the day of Pentecost, Peter's preaching to a great crowd, a multitude of people. And in verse 22, he's speaking mainly to Jewish people. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Peter didn't mince his words before that crowd, I can tell you. Does any wonder to put him that put him in prison. Verse 24. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death. Now watch this. Because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Now there's our text for this morning. It was not possible that he should be holden. It was not possible that he should be bound, fettered, chained, captivated, imprisoned by death. It was not possible. It's possible for us, but it was not possible for him that death should hold him. What a mighty text for a resurrection morning. Now, the question is this. Why was it not possible for death to hold him? And that's the question that I'll be answering to you this morning. Mind you, when you come to deal with our Lord, there's a lot of things that's not possible. Or there's a lot of things that's impossible. Of course, it was impossible for him to lie. He was truth all the way. It was impossible for him to sin. In him, there was no sin. And it's impossible for him to forget. And it's impossible for him to fail. He faileth 
not. I have that wee text in front of me for many years in my study up there. He faileth not. The flesh will fail us. Friends will fail us. The fellowship will fail us. Finances will fail us. Families will fail us. But he faileth not. Now, the first thing that this text teaches us is that his death was a painful one. Because it says, having been loosed, or it can be read like this, loosed from the pains of his death. You see, there's some death, and they're not painful deaths. But this death of my Savior was a painful death. And those of you who attended the prophetic meetings of the past four weeks or so will remember that I pointed out that the word sorrows that Jesus uses in Luke 24, Matthew 24, the word sorrows is the word travail, the contractions that a woman has in the latter stages of giving birth to a child, travailing. Well, it's the same word that's used here. The pains of death, that's the same word. The travailing, the sorrow, the groanings, the tears, the brokenness of my Savior as he hung upon the cross. The pains of death got hold of him. In Isaiah 53, we read these words. He shall see of the travail, that's the same word, of his soul and be satisfied. He certainly was satisfied when he birthed the church. But I wonder in the west of our world, is he satisfied with the church this morning? He saw the travail of his soul and he was satisfied because he traveled in sorrow and in pain to bring birth and bring life and resurrection to us. And I'm satisfied this morning I'm satisfied this morning that he's not satisfied with so much of the activity and work in the church today. But I wonder, is he satisfied with me? Jimmy Armstrong used to say that, I'm satisfied with him, but is he satisfied with me? And I'm certainly satisfied with him this morning. In the past couple of days, I've been reading over the crucifixion and the resurrection. And as I think of the pains and the sorrows and the tears and the trials and the batterings and the hammerings and the spittings, and as I refreshed my mind with it all again in the hours of darkness at Calvary, I can say, my friend, this morning, I'm completely and fully satisfied with my Savior. I'm satisfied with the pains, all oh, the pains that he suffered for me, and I'm satisfied with him. Pat and I, not long ago, stood at the back of the uh, Francis Alexander's home on Bishop Street there in Londonderry, and looking out over the bog side and the crag and then Rosemount and away down into the Donegal Hills, I thought of that hymn that you wrote, because in those days it were just green fields. There was no bog side, there was no crag and there was no Rosemount, there was no chapels, there was no houses. There is a green hill far away without a city wall where our dear Lord was crucified who died to save us all. We do not know, we cannot tell what pains he had to bear, but we believe it was for us he hung 
and suffered there. But not only do we see the pains in the text, there's the power in the text. Whom God raised up. The power of God raised him out of the grave. He himself said, all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Paul could say that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And friend, when we come to this morning, that's the one word that dominates the whole scene, the power of God. Death and devils and demons hadn't a chance to stand against the power of God. There's no power on earth greater than the power of the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God, creator, Jehovah of all things. In John's Gospel, chapter 10, he could say, I have power to lay down my life and take it up again, just as you laid down your hymn book there beside you, and you'll take it up in a few minutes' time. He says, I have the power to lay it down, and you have the power to take it up. He says, I have power to lay down my life and take it up again. Remember Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, and never miss this, he says we're sown in weakness and raised in power. He doesn't say we're buried. No, no. That would give the wrong impression. We're sown, we're like a seed sown. And that seed will come forth to life. Power. The power of death had no hold of him. Why was it not possible? Because of the power of God. Secondly, why it wasn't possible to hold him in the grave? Because of the person who he was. He could say, I am the resurrection and the life. Death had no claim to him because sin had no claim on him. He was wholly harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. If there was one small spot or inkling of sin in him, the grave would have held him, the devil would have mocked him, hell would have seized him, and death would have defeated him. But death passed upon all men, all have sinned. And sin, when it's finished, let me rub it in, bring us forth death. But there was no sin in him. All the sin of the world was on him. Boy, mine would have been enough. All the sin of the world was on him. It wasn't for his own sin he died. It was for our sins. Leonard Ravenhill used to say, when you come to the tomb, always remember that there was the stone, that there was the soldiers, that there was the seal. Oh, I, he says, but what have I forgot? All the sin of the world, of every man and woman ever committed or ever would commit, was in behind that stone upon my Savior. And up from the grave he arose with a mighty victory over the foes. He was the resurrection and the life and the whole power was given unto him. But there's not only the pains and the power and the person. There's the prophecy in the text. Look at verse 25. For David speaks concerning him. That's Christ. And that's the way back in the Psalms, a thousand years before the cross. 
And David spake concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. Watch this. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. David wasn't talking about himself. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Or thou wilt not suffer thy holy one. David wasn't the holy one. He was a sinner just like we and there's plenty of record to prove it. But he's speaking about the Messiah. This is a messianic psalm, Psalm 16. He's speaking about the Messiah. Thou wilt suffer thine, not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. He beat corruption. Lazarus was corrupted. He was stinking in four days. Christ beat it in three days. And the grave couldn't hold him because of this prophecy alone. Because I tell you, the scripture never prophesied anything that it didn't carry out and will carry out. And yon wee boy in North Korea need to watch himself. For he's only a relief in God's wind and all the rest of them. Everything that's prophesied here will prophesy. It'll not be done by with all his armaments that will burn up the world. God's not going to let man destroy his world. As the Lord will be in control of all this. And he doesn't need fire from an atomic bomb. There's plenty of fire in the scriptures without it. We mustn't go down that road this morning. But this was prophesied away a thousand years ago. <laughs> Thou wilt not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. It wasn't possible because of the power. It wasn't possible because of the person. It wasn't possible because of the prophecy. But that's not what I want to close with this morning. It's not possible because of the promise. Now look at verse 39. For the promise is unto you and to your children. Now, this boys are all asked to the Jews, he's speaking. Okay, we'll give them that if that's what they want. And to the children, them's the children of the Jews. We'll give them that if they want to. We'll okay that. But that's not really what he means. But we'll, we'll give them that. But we're not going to give them this last bit. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all those that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. I'm in there. And so are you this morning. Indeed we are. That's a promise. That's a promise to me and it's a promise to you this morning. And if you want me to back it up with Ephesians 2, Paul says this, but now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Oh, believers, as we close this morning, grip hold of this. There's a double barrel promise here. There's a promise of the spiritual resurrection and the promise of a physical resurrection. One past, one to come. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespass and in sins. He has brought me to life. He brought me to life on the last day of May, 1970, when the darkness passed and the true light shone in, when the glorious, marvelous light of the glorious gospel shone into the darkened heart, born again by the Spirit of quickened by the power of God. Me and you and sinners afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. If he kept the first promise, he'll keep the second promise. <laughs> he'll take us out of the grave if we die. I want you to turn with me to Romans 8 and verse 30, and then we'll close. I want to let you go home this morning with the assurance that you're going to come out of the grave if you die. And with the assurance that that loved one that you stood around the graveside with and shed the tears 
that old mother and that old father and that loved one and that child. Glory to God. It's not possible for them to be held. Not possible for the devil to hold them or you or me either. It's impossible because of Calvary, because of the cross, because of Christ. Look at Romans 8 and verse 30. Moreover, we're breaking in here to Paul. Whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Just keep your eye on that verse. Tell me how many times you see the word whom. How many times you'll see the word them. And if your verse is the same as mine, you'll see it whom three times and them three times. Now keep that in your mind. Because he starts off here, moreover, whom he did predestinate. Now that word predestinate means to be set apart. Someone interpreted as, uh, translated as to mark out as a blueprint for the future. Now hold on. You see, some people get election and predestination mixed up. When you come across these words when you're reading, they can confuse you. Election is to do with what we're chosen from. He is elected us out of darkness, out of the miry pit. He has selected us, elected us. Election is to do with what we're chosen from. Predestination is what we're called to. If you always remember that, you'll not go wrong with this. What we're called to. And we're we're called to be the image of Christ. We're called to different callings in our life and in our work and in the ministry. What are you called to this morning? What has he what has he elected and separated you for this morning? Because he has called you for something. Now watch the steps here. Also whom and them. We have the word also in it too, and mark the word also. Predestination, he says, away in eternity past. He has chosen us for a particular task and to ultimately conform us into the image of Christ. Secondly, then he called, then, then he also called the salvation. Do you remember the day when he called you? Come on to me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And he called us out of darkness into light and put his arms around us and shared the love of God abroad in our hearts. What a Savior. Them also he called as salvation. Let's go again. Whom he called, them he also justified. Now hold that. Because you have predestination, you have salvation, and you have justification. How did he justify us? Well, if you get your concordance, you'll find that there's four. I'll give you three of them. We're justified by faith. We're justified by grace. We're justified through his blood. But none of it could have happened without the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us, Paul, rising he justified us. That's the foundation stone of our salvation is the resurrection. If Christ be not risen from the dead, Paul says, your faith is in vain, you're yet in your sins, and you're of all men most miserable. Hallelujah! Just as if we had never sinned through the resurrection of Christ. And then watch it again. Whom he justified, them he also Glorified. Now, I'm sorry to have to say this this morning, but those who preach the doctrine of saved and lost have a problem with this verse. And I honestly don't know how they get around it with some other verses too. Because whom he predestinated, 
he called. And whom he called, he justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Not some of them. No, not some of them. Every last one of them. And you can handle the text whatever way you want. That's why I pointed out the also's, the whom, and the them. Because you can't separate it. Listen, listen to it again. Whom he predestinated, them he called. The same ones. Whom he called, he justified and left them as if they never sinned. Them also he glorified. That hasn't happened yet. But he's going to do it. And can I say to you in closing this morning, glorify him now. For some of these days, he's going to glorify you. Listen to Paul in closing. We're citizens of heaven. Philippians 3. From whence also we look for our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile bodies. You know, I was at a funeral not so long ago and I'd visited the person and the cancer had riddled him. Oh, big, healthy man. Just into a skeleton. You could hardly, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have recognized. And oh, thinking of all the morphine and all the tablets and all the stuff was pounded into that dear soul. Till the moment came when Jesus came and took him. And I was standing at the graveside and I was thinking, oh, what a state the old body's in. This body, this vessel that God has given to us. And I thought, oh, there's only one word, the Holy Ghost got it right. Vile body. Vile body. Paul says, who, who shall change our vile bodies like unto his glorious body and we'll be conformed to the image of his son. One day we're going to be like him. Be with him. We shall know him. And I can't tell you any more because the scripture doesn't tell us much more, but it's going to be glorious. It's going to be glory. Glory. Glory all the way. Why? Because the grave couldn't hold him. Boys, if the devil could have held him, we were all damned. Couldn't hold him because of the powers. Couldn't hold him because of the person. Couldn't hold him because of the prophecy. Couldn't hold him because of the promise. And he's going to descend the slopes of the sky some of these days. And he's going to take us out and it'll not be long. Let me tell you, it's not be long. And he's going to take us out. And he's going to change these old vile bodies that has given us all the problems. Like unto his glorious body. Because it was not possible that death could hold him. Hallelujah.